Welcome to Histories Unheard, where we delve into the lesser-known narratives of the past. In this documentary, we will unravel the captivating story of the fall of the Roman monarchy and the consequential birth of the Roman Republic. Join us as we explore the tumultuous events and compelling characters that shaped this pivotal transition in ancient Roman history. Through meticulous research and evocative storytelling, we aim to shed light on a critical period that has often been overshadowed by the grandeur of the Roman Empire. Get ready to embark on a journey through time and discover the untold tales of one of the most significant turning points in the ancient world. The fall of the Roman monarchy happened way back in ancient Rome during the 6th and 5th centuries BC. It was a big political revolution that replaced the monarchy under Lucius Tarquinius Superbus with a republic. As time went on, the details of this event faded from Roman memory, so later historians had to piece together a story. They traditionally set it around 509 BC, but nowadays, modern scholars mostly consider it to be fictional. The traditional account tells a story of a dynastic struggle where the king's second son, Sextus Tarquinius, unfortunately commits a terrible act by raping a noblewoman named Lucretia. Tragically, Lucretia takes her own life after revealing the assault to some Roman noblemen. However, this heartbreaking event leads to a turning point in Roman history. The Roman noblemen, led by the courageous Lucius Junius Brutus, rallied the support of the Roman aristocracy and the people to stand against the king and his family, ultimately leading to the creation of a republic. With the backing of the Roman army, Brutus successfully forces the king into exile. Despite several attempts by Lucius Tarquinius Superbus to regain power and reinstate the monarchy, the resilient Roman people triumph in establishing a republic. From that point forward, the city elects two consuls annually to govern. Many modern scholars may dismiss this narrative as fictitious, but there is no concrete evidence for or against it. Some scholars have dismissed certain aspects of the traditional story, questioning the historicity of its major characters and even the existence of the overthrow. However, it's important to note that opinions on this matter may vary. Before we move on, if you're enjoying the content so far, don't forget to subscribe to the channel. Subscribing will keep you updated with the latest videos and help support the channel. Thanks for watching so far. Scholars and the ancient sources themselves have different opinions on when the monarchy was overthrown and how old the resulting republic was. The most well-known date for the establishment of the republic, and therefore the expulsion of the kings, is 509 BC. The specific dating to 509 BC comes from the Veronian chronology, which was put together during the late republic by Marcus Terentius Varro and later used by the Fasti Capitolini. It's worth noting that the Veronian chronology might be four years behind the actual dates in the earlier period, i.e. Veronian year 344 corresponds to the real year 340 BC. The Romans could have easily determined the age of their republic by looking at the list of consuls. Every year, two consuls were elected, and by counting the number of consular pairs, they could estimate how many years the republic had been in existence. According to the Fasti Capitolini, which relies on the Veronian chronology, the Republic dates back to 509 BC. Livy's list of consuls suggests that the Republic began around 502 to 1 BC. However, it's important to note that the accuracy of the consuls' lists is crucial for this estimation. Nevertheless, later historians reported dates that align roughly with that time, indicating that the Republic was indeed founded. Another account is provided by Gnaeus Flavius, who proudly states that his temple to Concordia was dedicated 204 years after the dedication of the capital. His temple was dedicated in 303 BC, which suggests that the capital, traditionally believed to have been dedicated in the first year of the Republic, was actually dedicated in 507. Isn't history full of surprises? However, it's worth mentioning that modern scholars have expressed some skepticism regarding much of this traditional chronology, particularly when it comes to the dedication of the capital. The main point of contention revolves around whether the earlier entries on the consular are factually authentic or if they were fabricated. Quite a few historians have argued that the Fasti are an unreliable anachronism from the late Republic. 
Resolving this matter is quite challenging, though, primarily due to the lack of reliable sources. As the historian Fred Drogola aptly puts it, we have no way to prove or disprove most of the information contained in the Fasti. According to the traditional account, a group of aristocrats overthrow the last king, Lucius Tarquinius Superbus, in response to the rape of the noblewoman Lucretia by the king's second son, Sextus Tarquinius. After revealing the rape to some noblemen, Lucretia commits suicide. The resulting outrage leads to an uprising against the ruling family, led by some of the king's relatives, Lucius Junius Brutus, the king's nephew, Lucius Tarquinius Collatinus, the king's cousin and Lucretia's husband, and Spurius Lucretius Trisipitinus, Lucretia's father. They are also joined by an influential friend Publius Valerius Poplicola. Before we move on, if you're enjoying the content so far, don't forget to subscribe to the channel. Subscribing will keep you updated with the latest videos and help support the channel. Thanks for watching so far. During this time, Tarquin was conducting a war against Ardea, but he quickly rushed back to Rome upon hearing news of the coup. Unfortunately, the city is closed off to him, and the coup leaders managed to convince the army at Ardea to join their cause. As a result, the king's sons are expelled. However, there is a silver lining, as Brutus and Collatinus step up to become the first consuls. In a heartfelt gesture, Brutus administers an oath before the people, vowing to never tolerate a king in Rome again, and promising to eliminate anyone who tries to restore the monarchy. Among Brutus's many reforms, he suggests banishing all members of the Tarquin clan. This decision ultimately leads to the banishment of his co-consul Collatinus as well, who is then replaced by Poplola. It's worth noting that during this early period, the Romans referred to the consuls as praetores, which means leaders. Soon after, Brutus's two sons, who happened to be the brothers of Brutus's wife, the Vitellii, the Aquilii, and relatives of Colatinus, are discovered plotting to restore the monarchy. After the conspiracy is exposed by a slave, Brutus, in a shocking turn of events, orders the death of his sons and relatives. Meanwhile, Tarquin, that sneaky guy, flees to Etruria and manages to persuade various cities there to attack Rome and restore him to the throne. But alas, their efforts are in vain as they are unsuccessful and defeated at the Battle of Silva Arcia, where Brutus falls in battle. However, all is not lost. Poplicola, the hero of the day, returns to celebrate a triumph for victory over the Etruscans. Tarquin, not one to give up easily, then requests aid from Lars Porsena, the king of Clusium. Porsena marches on Rome, but holds on tight because Horatius Cocal steps up to the plate and defends a bridge all by himself against Porsena's forces until it can be demolished. Talk about bravery. The heroism of the Republic's youths and Rome's mighty force of arms managed to persuade Porsena to give up his campaign. Tarquin then reaches out to his son-in-law, Octavius Mamilius of Tusculum, who kindly gathers the Latin League against Rome until they too are unfortunately defeated at the Battle of Lake Regillus, with the Romans receiving divine assistance from Castor and Pollux. With no more allies willing to attack the Romans, Tarquin bids farewell and embarks on a more permanent exile in Cumae before peacefully passing away in 495 BC. The Roman government then transitions into the hands of a group of esteemed aristocratic families, the patricians, who graciously elect magistrates from among their ranks, setting up conditions for the so-called conflict of the orders. There are so many different theories about what happened at the start of the Republic. It's fascinating how the evidence is sparse enough that multiple stories can be plausibly put forth. Nowadays, there are modern views that range from a semi-traditional account, which accepts the general facts of Roman tradition, to hypercritical accounts that argue that basically all of Rome's early history is the result of artificial numerological exercises, an almost pure invention from association with other historical events. The semi-traditionalist approach is based on the idea of embracing Roman tradition as accurate when it comes to general events, but considering the specific narrative details as fictional. This theory was fully developed in Tim Cornell's 1995 book, Beginnings of Rome, and has garnered some support from scholars. Taking into account those general events, a domestic crisis catalyzes a revolution in Rome around 500 BC, leading to the overthrow of the existing monarchy in the city. During this period, 
Rome also becomes embroiled in a larger conflict that affected most of Tyrrhenian Italy. It is worth noting that similar revolutions were occurring in other states around the same time. Lars Porsena steps in to help out in northern Latium during this chaotic period, although we're not exactly sure if he played a role in the downfall of the Tarquins or if Tarquin himself asked for his assistance. It seems that Porsena's Etruscan forces may have taken control of Rome and then headed south to confront the Latins, but unfortunately they suffered a major defeat at Aresia. This story is also backed up by Dionysius of Halicarnassus's account of Aristodemus of Cumae, which confirms Porsena's defeat and gives us a date of 504 BC for the Battle of Aricia, according to a separate Greek historical tradition. Also, suggesting anti-royal sentiment around 500 BC, there is evidence in the archaeological record of destruction around the Comitium. The royal sanctuary near Santo Mobono at the foot of the Capitoline Hill was also destroyed and abandoned for around a century. Cornell argues that the abandonment of the site at Santo Mobono contributes to the general impression of an oligarchic coup against a populist tyranny, which was then forced to concede power to the army represented in the Comitia Centuriata. If the king had been in the habit of nominating two army officers for approval from the Comitia, an attractive hypothesis is that it was they who overthrew their master and took over the state. Cornell also suggests that this populist tyranny had, for some time, transformed the older traditionalist kingship into the ceremonial rex sacrorum. According to Cornell, it is easy to speculate that this title descended from a real king whose political powers had been reduced to mere ceremony. He draws a parallel between this situation and the modern British monarchy or the Archon Basilius at Athens. One theory in this line of thought proposes that the previous king, Servius Tullius, ruled as a popular life magistrate, which can be considered a form of tyranny in ancient Greek terms. There is also speculation that Tullius's supposed original name, Mastarna, is an Etruscan corruption of the Latin word magister, which is similar to magister populi, one of the other titles of a Roman dictator. The fact that a vestigial dictatorship survived instead of being replaced by two consuls as is the norm, also suggests similarities with other Latin towns that were ruled by dictators. For example, Alba Longa supposedly replaced its king with two annually elected dictators before its destruction. Alternatively, there is another theory that is widely accepted among scholars, including Gary Forsyth. According to this theory, the Republic emerged as a result of Lars Porsena's invasion, this particular idea was initially proposed by Andreas Alfeldi back in 1965. In this scenario, it is believed that Porsena successfully captured Rome, leading to the direct abolition of the monarchy or the king being forced to flee. Tarquin, the king, seeks support from other Latin cities while Porsena uses Rome as a base to invade Latium. However, following the Etruscan defeat at the Battle of Aricia in 54 BC, Porsena is compelled to retreat leaving the Romans to confront the Latin attempts to reinstate Tarquin as king. When the Latins are unable to prevail by force of arms at Lake Regillus, Tarquin then goes into exile in Cumae, leaving the Republic standing. If this theory is true, it would also explain the appointment of Brutus and Collatinus. Porsena would want to install someone to govern the city, and members of the former royal house would lend legitimacy to his occupation. Having a co-equal pair of officials would also help prevent abuses. According to this story, when Porsena withdrew, the two officials were retained and turned into the classical consuls. This theory could also be plausibly combined with Cornell's semi-traditionalist account above by proposing that Porsena's intervention was opportunistically related to Rome's overthrow of its monarchy and the resulting unstable power struggle. There is also substantial archaeological evidence of destruction in central Etruria around the end of the 6th century, suggesting major interstate conflict, making the use of military force, even without an internal Roman political crisis, not implausible. Some scholars also question the dating of the Republic's foundation around 500 BC. One interesting hypothesis suggests that the Capitoline Temple might be older than the Republic itself. According to this theory, the Republic's fasti, official records, were possibly manipulated to align the temple's foundation with the establishment of the Republic. 
In a 1963 monograph, Robert Werner put forth this argument. He proposed that certain names in the Fasti, particularly those of Etruscan origin, could be fabricated. He dismissed plebeian names, assuming that they were incapable of holding the consulship. By adjusting the timeline, the Republic's establishment could be pushed to 472 BC, which coincides with the decline of Etruscan influence in central Italy. Alternatively, it's possible that the foundation of the Capitoline Temple coincided with the introduction of eponymous magistrates, magistrates who gave their names to the year, even before the formation of a republic, where those magistrates held state power. Eponymous magistrates and a Roman kingdom can coexist. The ephors of Sparta were ruled by kings, but still gave their names to the years. The eponymous magistrate was not abolished during the Pisistratid tyranny in Athens either. According to Christer Hanel's hypothesis, the Fasti have nothing to do with the Republic at all. In his view, the Republic emerged gradually as royal power faded away into the hands of the eponymous magistrates, who eventually became the consuls. Cornell argues that Hanel's hypothesis only makes sense if we assume from the beginning that the creation of the Republic was a gradual process. And unfortunately, there is little evidence to support or refute this assumption. Also alternatively, Einar Gerstad suggested that moving the expulsion of the kings to a cultural break around 450 BC aligns with archaeological evidence of impoverishment and the disappearance of Etruscan names from the consular Fasti. This theory combines acceptance of the Fasti with the argument that the Republic's foundation may not coentemple that of the temples. However, Gerstad's theory lacks evidence for the end of Etruscan rule coinciding with the monarchy's expulsion. Cornell dismisses all of these views as overly revisionist and reliant on a complex mixture of archaeological and literary data, while making strong assumptions about the changes brought about by the expulsion of the kings. On the other hand, more critical historians, like Forsyth, believe that Cornell's treatment is too trusting and overly optimistic about the nature of the source material. Scholars have acknowledged that many of the traditional stories were fabricated by incorporating later events and literary tropes into the past, with dates likely copied from other Hellenistic historical traditions. In these traditions, assigning the same dates to similar events in different societies resolved the issue of numerous events in various societies lacking firm dates. That early Roman history was reconstructed, or, less generously, in Cicero's description of forgery, was well known even to the Romans themselves. The primary sources of Roman history to the ancient Romans were lists noting the achievements of family ancestors and priestly notices, all of which lacked chronological significance. Specific years were then assigned by synchronism with various other events under various reconstructions, for even major events such as the Gallic sack of Rome, the surviving ancient historians disagreed at what occurred in what year. For example, Alexander Koptev argued in 2010 that the placement of dates in early Roman history was rooted in a single source by Timaeus of Tauromenium, which, as chronological Urvetter, shaped the chronological skeleton of Roman history, basing it on a comparison with the Hellenistic world directly influencing the analysts, whose works flow forward to the sources we have today. Timaeus performed artificial numerological exercises, which provided a chronology onto which dimly remembered oral stories, like that of the expulsion of the kings, could be placed. Here, Timaeus's Dean of G, the start of the Republic, was an arbitrary synchronism. It started in merely the same year in which Cleisthenes established democracy in Athens, 510 9 BC. This also neatly explains why Roman history accords with Dionysius' discussion of the war between Cumae and Etruria. It was placed there deliberately. Similarly, according to some historians, Livy's account of the early Republic follows a cyclic approach to history. They believe that there is a pattern of moral virtues rising and then declining, with each cycle lasting around 360-365 years. The cycle begins with Romulus, and reaches its peak under King Servius Tullius. Then there is a second founding under Camillus, completing the cycle. This leads to another peak during the time of Scipio Africanus, before Augustus comes in as the figure to re-establish Rome and start the cycle again. 
Livy suggests that Romulus, Camillus, and Augustus are all equally heroic figures. The critical approach also emphasizes how the sources we have today were influenced by the political concerns and ideologies of Livy's time. It is believed that these sources were shaped to promote favorable political narratives about Rome's early history. As we wrap up this journey through the fall of the Roman monarchy and the rise of the Roman Empire, it's clear that this pivotal period in history shaped the world as we know it today. From the overthrow of the Etruscan kings to the emergence of the Roman Republic and ultimately the establishment of the Roman Empire, the transformation of Rome was a turning point in the intricate interplay of political intrigue, military conquests, and cultural evolution laid the foundation for one of the most influential civilizations in history. The legacy of the Roman Empire continues to resonate across the centuries, influencing law, governance, architecture, and so much more. We hope you found this exploration of ancient Rome both insightful and captivating. If you enjoyed this video, don't forget to subscribe to Histories Unheard for more fascinating journeys through the annals of history. Join us as we uncover the untold stories and lesser-known events that have shaped our world. Hit that subscribe button and turn on notifications so you never miss out on our latest releases. Thank you for watching, and we'll see you in the next episode of Histories Unheard.